Good morning to those of you who are gathered here for worship in the building at Second Presbyterian Church in Portsmouth, Ohio. Good morning to those of you who are listening on WIOI this morning, and hello to those of you who are watching on the live stream with us, perhaps right now, perhaps catching up on the service later on today or this week. My name is Allison Bauer, and I'm the pastor here at Second Pres, and I'm glad to share the leadership of this worship service with our director of music, Dr. Stan Workman, and the chancel choir. Today's worship broadcast on WIOI is sponsored by Pastor Evan and Marge Fisher, and they are sponsoring that in memory of his brother, Sergeant John Oliver Fisher. So Evan, I think you're probably watching, and we are grateful for your sponsorship today. If you take a look at the announcement page in the bulletin, I want to first say thank you, thank you, thank you to everyone who joined us for a very joyful Easter Sunday last week. Um, I did have a few bags of Stealthy Joy cheese doodles left over, and I decided uh, to add those to the emergency food bags that we give out um, when the pantry is closed. Folks can come in for emergency food, and I thought that would be a good way of sharing some joy with folks with the leftovers from our celebration last week. Um, you will see in the bulletin that it was on Friday they drew the name for the winner of the lottery basket. Uh, unfortunately, we print the bulletins on Thursdays, but I didn't want to forget to announce it on Sunday morning, so that's why there's a blank in there to remind me to say that Billy Massey won the uh, lottery ticket raffle um, basket, and I heard that he was very grateful uh, to win that basket, so we were grateful to everybody who bought tickets for that fundraising event. Our monthly game night will be held on Friday, April 26th, which is also Arbor Day. We like to have a theme for our game nights, and that was the only Friday holiday I could find, um, starting at 6 p.m. And we've talked about this for a little while, but we haven't done it, so I'm just making the executive decision that this is going to be the night where, if you want to, you're encouraged to play card games. There's been lots of conversations about Euchre and Canasta in particular. Um, I'm a big 500 Rummy fan as well as a 500 Bid fan. If anybody knows how to play 500 Bid, I'd love to get together and play that again. Um, so I'm talking about those kinds of card games, not other kinds of card games. Although what you do at your table is, I suppose, up to you. But um, someone also has suggested we're kind of upping our snack game as the months goes on. And somebody said, what if we try to do a taco bar? And everyone signed up ahead of time to bring a certain ingredient, and then we just sort of lay those all out, and then you can have a taco or a taco salad or whatever you want. Oh, I heard a noise of some sort of recognition when I said that, so I don't know if that's a good idea or a bad idea, but come and see me after the service if you think that's a good idea, and we can start divvying up the topics or the toppings <laughs> for that. And there are a few other announcements in the bulletin, but I trust that you will check those out on your own. And if you have any questions, you can always get in touch with us in the office throughout the week. I think the only thing that I have left to say is that I'm grateful that you're worshiping with us today. Again, whether you're here in the building or at home or at work or in the car or wherever it is you are, that you find yourself in this moment in time. And it is my prayer today and always that God will come close to you in this time of worship and give you whatever it is you need this day. For this is the day that the Lord has made. So let us rejoice and be glad in it. Please join with me in the call to worship printed in the bulletin. We declare what was from the beginning, what we have heard. We declare what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands. The word of life was revealed to us in the incarnation, and we have seen him and testify to him, declaring that eternal life has been revealed. What we have seen and heard, we also declare to each other so that we may have fellowship together and with the Father and the Son. We declare these things so that our joy and God's joy may be made complete in our fellowship.
1 John verses 8 and 9 tell us that if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If, on the other hand, we confess our sins, he who is faithful and just will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So, Let us declare our sin before God and each other that we might be cleansed from all unrighteousness using the unison prayer of confession printed in the bulletin. God of mercy, we come celebrating our unity, but we confess all the ways that we let ourselves be divided. Our nationality, ethnic origin, economic status, gender, sexuality, age, political affiliation, and far too many personal preferences. Too often these individual traits obscure the common calling we share in Christ's name. Forgive our tendency toward separation and division, reminding us that we are your Easter people. May our common identity as your beloved children and our communal witness to Christ bind us together in your name. Friends, when we walk in the light of Christ, we have fellowship with one another. When we confess our sins, the one who is faithful and just forgives our sins and cleanses us from all unrighteousness. For in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, God has showered mercy upon the entire world. So know that your sin is forgiven and be at peace. Please be seated. And let us pray. O God, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, we may hear what you are saying to us today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our first scripture reading this morning comes from a short little psalm, Psalm 133. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. How very good and pleasant it is when kindred live together in unity. It is like the precious oil on the head running down upon the beard, on the beard of Aaron running down over the collar of his robes. It is like the dew of Hermon, which falls on the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord ordained his blessing, life forevermore. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
during the month of April, we're going to do something I don't normally do with the scripture readings and the sermons. I like stories. I think we generally learn best from stories, which is why Jesus taught using parables, which are a particular kind of story. And so that's why when I'm picking what I'm going to preach on or what I think God wants me to preach on, I normally use the passages from the lectionary readings that have the stories. But this month, instead of stories, we're going to read parts of what some people call a letter, other people call a tract, like one of those paper pamphlet things. I don't know if people hand them out anymore, but they used to be very popular to pass out on the street, um, talking about salvation. And still others call it a sermon. Now, of all those options, I kind of like the idea of a sermon the best, although I don't, preaching a sermon on a sermon, I'm not sure that's sort of an interesting paradox, but we'll figure that out as we go. Um, So in the lectionary, the um, third reading that is offered there is usually from a letter, something from Paul, something from um, Peter, usually written to a particular church. But in this season of Easter, these days between Easter Sunday and Pentecost, a lot of the scripture readings are from the book known as 1 John which is one you maybe don't hear from very often. So there's 1 John and 2 John and 3 John. And they're all short little books. 1 John is the longest. They're all short little books kind of tucked in toward the end of the New Testament. So presuming we don't know a whole lot about 1 John, uh, there's three things you need to know before we dive into like the next month of sermons on this book slash sermon called 1 John. So the first is you might be curious about the Gospel of John, 1st and 2nd and 3rd John, Revelation, which is often associated with a John as the author of that as well. So most biblical scholars believe that the author of 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John is the same John who is responsible for the Gospel of John. So technically, probably, those four things are all written by the same person but probably not the same John that we think wrote Revelation. So we've got 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, Gospel of John, and the Revelation sort of over here by itself. And this John, who wrote these books over here, is probably the disciple of Jesus. And he and his brother James, uh, the sons of Zebedee, were among the first disciples that Jesus called to come and follow him, if you remember that story, they were in their boat fixing their nets with their dad, and Jesus walked up and said, hey, come and follow me, and they're like, sure, and just dropped everything and walked away. It's that John, we think, wrote these three books in that gospel. So if you read, and I encourage you to go home and read, um, I think I, I decided to read them out loud to see how long it would take me to get through first, second, and third John. I think reading out loud, it took me 17 minutes. So these are not long books to read. So I encourage you to go home and look, at least read them to yourself if you don't read them out loud. So you'll see 2nd and 3rd John read like the other letters of the Bible that we're used to. They have this typical greeting and they mention who it's coming from and who the letter is written to, who it's intended for. But 1st John is different. It doesn't have any of those things, which makes it completely different from all of the other letters in the Bible. So that's why some people would call it a tract or a sermon, not a letter. We're going to call it a sermon for our purposes. And then third thing to know, of the three short books attributed to John, 1 John has the most to do with John's gospel. So if you're really interested in 1 John, you should go back and revisit John's gospel. For example, in the gospel, he's very big on this image of light as being sort of with God and darkness as being separated from God. And then starting in verse 5 of this passage from 1 John, this starts to use that same imagery of light and darkness. And the hymn that we're going to sing matches those words 
of light and darkness. And as an optometrist in the choir remarked, talking about light and darkness is a great thing to do the day before a solar eclipse is happening tomorrow. So the lectionary was totally on theme with what was happening in the year 2024. So all that is to say, as I read today's passage from 1 John 1, 1, and we're going to get through the whole chapter, we're going to start chapter 2, and I think verse 6 is about halfway through. So listen for any similarities in vocabulary and details that you may remember from John's gospel, because you're going to hear a lot of things from 1 John that you've probably already heard from the gospel of John. So hear again what the Spirit is saying to you, the church. We declare to you what was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. This life was revealed, and we have seen it and testify to it and declare to you the eternal life that was with the Father and was revealed to us. What we have seen and heard, we also declare to you, so that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We are writing these things so that our joy, which we've been talking about a lot during Lent, so that our joy may be complete. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you, that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him while we are walking in darkness, we lie and do not do what is true. But if we walk in the light, as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus his Son cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, do these words sound familiar? If we confess our sins, he who is faithful and just will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. My little children, it's a term of affection, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. Now we, now by this we know that we have come to know him if we obey his commandments. That's going to be a theme we're going to hear come up again. Whoever says, I have come to know him, but does not obey his commandments is a liar. And in such a person, the truth does not exist. But whoever obeys his word, truly in this person, the love of God has reached perfection. By this we know that we are in him. Whoever says, I abide in him, ought to walk in the same way as he walked. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. See, it's a whole different ball game listening to a bunch of theology than it is listening to Jesus tell a story. So it may seem odd at first that the Revised Common Lectionary, which is this established set of scripture readings used in a lot of mainline denominations like ours, it may seem a little odd that they intentionally include these readings from 1 John because we're supposed to be celebrating Jesus' resurrection. But there's nary a word about resurrection in this reading, right? We haven't read the word resurrection yet. So why did they pick these readings? It doesn't make any sense. And the people who put these set of readings together really know their stuff. So there must be something going on. Maybe resurrection is there. We just have to look a little more closely for it. 
So let's go back and look at those first verses again. It says, we declare what was from the beginning and what we heard, saw, looked at, and touched, a life revealed. So first thing we got to figure out is who is the we and who is we talking about here? Because again, it says in a letter like every other letter, there's no greeting that identifies who's writing and who's reading it and what the occasion of the letter is. So given what I told you before we started the reading, the we, we think, is John and probably some of the other disciples that are working with him now. And the life revealed, who do you think that is? It's Jesus, right? So we know that on Easter Sunday, the disciples saw and believed, but did not yet understand what had happened. They didn't yet understand that Jesus had risen from the dead and had been resurrected. But that experience starts them on the journey to understanding. Seeing it and hearing it leads to believing it or starting to believe it. So this journey that they started at Easter sort of jumps into hyperdrive now when according to the stories at the end of John's gospel, what happens after Jesus dies? They're all huddled in the upper room together. The doors are locked. They're afraid. And they see the risen Jesus physically appear in the room with them. He doesn't come in through a door. He doesn't climb through a window. He just appears among them. And what do they hear him say? They hear him talking to him. And what do they do? They put their fingers in the holes in his sides and in his hands. And then later on in another story, they even watch and smell as he cooks them a fish breakfast on the beach. All of these senses that they're using in this experience of the risen Jesus. So let's go back and look at verses one and two again, right? What does it say? We declare to you what was from the beginning, what we have heard, they talked to Jesus, what we have seen with our eyes, they saw him appear in the room, what we have looked at and touched with our hands, they touched his physical body, concerning the word of life, Jesus. This life, Jesus, was revealed, and we have seen it and testified to it and declare to you the eternal life that was with the Father and was revealed to us. So without using the word resurrection, they're describing resurrection. They are describing their firsthand experience of the resurrected Jesus to a T. And now that they have that firsthand experience, they believe. They have experienced it with their own senses, so now they can trust and believe in Jesus' resurrection. So technically, John doesn't use the word resurrection in this passage, but we certainly can, and I think we will, find references to the resurrection throughout the book of 1 John. And it might be an interesting game to play at home if you're going to read 1 John on your own, uh, to look for where, where resurrection is, even if that word isn't used. Because I'm pretty sure resurrection is always there, lingering in the background, influencing every word of this book, at least. So I was thinking about these four verses right at the very beginning, kind of the introduction to the sermon. And I think it's fascinating. I think it's fascinating that 1 John uses so many senses to describe the experience of believing in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And again, I seem to be mildly obsessed with these first four verses, so let's look at them again. They are declaring what they have heard and seen and looked at and touched with their own hands. This life was revealed to them, and they declare eternal life to all who read this sermon. So they're talking about believing in the resurrection, but they don't use words like decided. Or, based upon the evidence presented to me, I have logically deduced that. 
They don't even really use the word believe, as though they have made this intellectual, conscious choice to believe. Instead, they use these sensory words to describe what they experience with the risen Jesus. So if we think about what we have read in John's gospel, again, in those last couple chapters where Jesus has risen from the dead and is interacting with the disciples, if you go back and read those stories, he's not arguing with them. He's not lecturing them. He's not trying to convince them that he's alive. Again, he simply appears among them, and he reassures them with his presence. And I think it's probably good that he doesn't try to argue them into faith, because resurrection doesn't make reasonable, logical sense. That's part of the mystery of faith. So if you think about this process of believing, this spectrum of believing, at some point, yes, the disciples do make a decision to believe in the resurrection. But isn't it interesting that that's not part of their testimony here? It's not what they're writing about here. They're writing about their experience with their bodily senses, not their brains. Now, I'm lingering here, I'm dwelling here, because we Presbyterians, we tend to live in our heads an awful lot, and not so much in our bodies. We pay a lot of attention, perhaps too much attention, to the thoughts that run around in our heads like hamsters on a wheel. And we sometimes miss what those thoughts feel like in our bodies. But here, John and the disciples, they're doing just that. They're describing how their belief in the resurrection isn't just an intellectual experience. It's a sensory embodied experience as well. And I don't think I had ever noticed that before, all of these sensory and experiential words. And I have to say that makes me ask what is probably an obvious question. So thinking about this in the grand scheme of things, it's fine and dandy for those first disciples to have had this embodied experience of faith to help them believe in the resurrection. But what about the rest of us? How are we supposed to have a sensory experience of the resurrection that will also convict us down deep in our bones so that we too can declare and testify concerning the word of life like those first disciples did. We know we're supposed to do that. But how do we do that when we don't have that same experience? Well, good news. First John has an answer for that question too, and it's tucked inside these first couple of verses that I can't seem to get past in this sermon. So if you wanted to go back and look at verse 3 again, they are declaring to their readers the eternal life that was with the Father was revealed, and we have seen and heard and also declare to you so that you may have, what does it say, fellowship with us. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. So the disciples' first experience of faith in the resurrection happens in the context of a community of faith, having a communal experience. It's an experience of fellowship. Fellowship with one another and fellowship with God. So if you think back to Psalm 1, 33, it's kind of the lived experience of that. Psalm 133 talks about how good and pleasant it is when people live together in unity. The oil of anointing running down one's face, that oil is a gift and it's a blessing for living in unity together. So fast forward from that Easter Sunday all the way to 2024, How can we experience that resurrection event? Well, our sensory experience of that can be experienced in community, in community with other people. 
because we are to be as Christ to each other, to love one another as Christ has loved us in all of these embodied and sensory ways of seeing and hearing and speaking with each other. So it is this for us now, this experience of generous love and particularly forgiveness and reconciliation, which First John also talks about toward the end of this passage. Love, forgiveness, and reconciliation, that all gives us the same kind of experience of God's divine and mysterious love and presence as those first disciples had. It connects us all together. This experience inducts us into the, fellow, the greater fellowship of the saints of the church with the Father and the Son and the wild and uncontainable Holy Spirit. So it's like, it's like First John is saying we're all connected. It's all connected. And yes, people can be tricky. Relationships can be difficult to navigate. But that's what we've got. We've got each other. We've got fellowship with each other and fellowship with God. And that's enough. Okay, one more question, then I'm done. I promise. But this time it's someone else's question, not mine. So normally in the week leading up to a sermon, I read a lot of stuff about what other people say about the scripture that we're going to be talking about. And in an article reflecting on this passage from 1 John, a preaching professor suggests asking a non-Christian, and maybe Christians too, he says, ask this question, what is the point of Christian faith? Or, in another way, what is the point of the resurrection? So, without you worrying about having to answer in the middle of this worship service, let me just ask you this question. What do you think is the point of Christian faith and the point of resurrection? And if you have some thoughts on that, you can join us for Sunday school, because I have a feeling that will be a topic of conversation, of which... There will be several opinions, which I'm very much looking forward to. So as this professor is writing, he says that for many, the answer to this question, what is the point of Christian faith? He says, many people will say, the answer is, Jesus came so that I'll live forever. And he says, while that's not a wrong answer, he does call that a self-centered answer. And I thought, ooh, that's an interesting thing to say. And he goes on to say that that kind of answer reflects a very individualistic kind of faith. But as I've just been talking about in the other three quarters of this sermon, the experience of faith for Jesus and the disciples is through fellowship with others. So faith is very much an individual experience, but it naturally becomes a communal experience as it grows. Mm. But somewhere along the way, in our individualistic American way of thinking, I think we've wandered astray from the original experience of communal faith. And I know I'm not preaching on a story, but now I'm going to tell you a story that I think illustrates this. Um, I, I had to get a new phone a couple of weeks ago. So I was in the uh, phone store for about 45 minutes doing all of the things you have to do when you get a new phone. And I was talking to the employee who was helping me, and he made the mistake of asking me what I did for a living. <clears throat> and when people ask me that question, they usually regret it, and I usually regret it too, but this time it worked out okay, I think. So he asked, and when I told him, uh, thus began a long conversation about life and Christian faith. And so he was not afraid to tell me what he thought, and I really liked that part of the conversation. So he, he talked about faith. For him, it was a very individualistic thing. He liked God a lot, but he didn't have much use for churches. <laughs> he said that kind of apologetically to me, knowing what I did for a living. 
And I did tell him what church I was a pastor of, so hi, AT&T employee, if you happen to be watching, <laughs> this is you I'm talking about. Um, so I was, I was biting my tongue really hard during that conversation, and then when I started writing the sermon, I thought of him again, and I'm so tempted to go back and ask him this question, what is the point of Christian faith? because I'm guessing his answer would be the same, and again, what this preacher would say, kind of self-centered answer of, well, Jesus came so that I'll live forever. But that just doesn't seem to jive with the communal stories of experiencing faith through fellowship. Fellowship among the disciples, among the people, and fellowship with God, does it? So instead, at the end of this article about this passage in 1 John, the preaching professor suggests that the point of Christian faith is the capacity of the risen Christ to draw individuals into authentic life together today. And I would go on to say the capacity of the risen Christ to draw individuals together, to glorify God together today to get us to work together to help build the kingdom of God today. So hear me when I say that first answer isn't wrong, but maybe there's a more complete answer. And this is what we're going to be talking about for the next couple of weeks. First John has a lot to say about this more complete answer. Mainly, first John will tell us that it's not just about what will happen one day, someday, when we get to live forever. But rather, it's much more about how we will walk together as children of the light this day. Together. Not someday, but this day. In the name of the Father and the Son and the wild and uncontainable Holy Spirit. Amen.
Please join with me in the affirmation of faith printed in the bulletin. This is the good news that we have received, in which we stand, and by which we are saved, if we hold it fast. That Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day, and that he appeared first to the women, then to Peter, and to the twelve, and then to many faithful witnesses. We believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus Christ is the first and the last, the beginning and the end. He is our Lord and our God. Amen. Please be seated. And let us unite our hearts and minds in a word of prayer. God of all creation, God who called every being into life, God who is mindful of humanity in all of its variety, God who embodies us with dignity, granting different gifts and talents to different people to shape our life in this world. We ask for your spirit to unite us. Unite us where we face lack of understanding. Unite us where there is disunity. Disunity in our churches, in our communities, in our country. And in silence, we lay before you the burdens of our hearts, the places where we feel disconnected and cut off from others. We ask for your spirit to unite us in the face of conflicts and hatred and violation of life experienced in so many regions of the earth. In silence, we bring to you our fault, the ways that we have caused division, but we also bring you the pain of those who are victims of division. We ask for your spirit to unite us, to unite us wherever fear gets in the way, wherever fear prevents us from caring for our neighbor, from meeting people who are different from us in a place of respect. And so in silence, we bring to you the brokenness of our human relationships because fellowship with each other and fellowship with you, that's all we've got to hang on to. God of all creation, in Christ's death on Easter and his resurrection on Easter, we have been reconciled with you. So we ask for your reconciling spirit to help us to overcome all of our divisions, that we may live together in the kind of peace that Psalm 133 describes to us. And now we ask that you would hear us as we unite our voices 
to once again pray the way the church has prayed together for generation after generation, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. As we continue our worship with our, the giving of our tithes and offerings, hear these words from 1 John chapter 3. We're going to get to these a little bit later on. 1 John says, How does God's love abide in anyone who has the world's goods and sees a brother and sister in need and yet refuses to help? Dear children, let us love not in word or speech, but also in truth and action. So let us demonstrate our love through the giving of our tithes and offerings.
Let us pray. Generous and surprising God, when we thought that death had claimed your only son, you amazed us with the resurrection. Surprise us again with your ability to turn these humble offerings into gifts that will transform the world through our witness to your love. We lay our very lives at your feet, knowing that you will use us to proclaim and embody the gospel. Amen. And now as you leave this time of worship, be strong and courageous, knowing the Lord himself goes before you and will be with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. So do not be afraid. But instead, be of good courage and know that without a doubt that you are loved by me and by the Father and the Son and the wild and uncontainable Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>